Kenton, thank you. Well, good morning. All right, it's good to see all of you. You can tell we've had a lot of cloudy days because when the sun comes out, there's a lot more people on this side in the sanctuary trying to soak in those rays uh, while we got them. You just never know. Sometimes 10 minutes is all we're going to get it in a single week. So uh, soak it up. Don't move. Stay right where you're at. And if some of you want to go over there, I suppose that would be cool too. We'll just feel a little lopsided. Well, good morning. It is so good to see all of you, and um, we are excited to be here in the house of the Lord, praising his name together. So would you please stand with us and let us first hear from Psalm 135. It says, I know that the Lord is great, that our Lord is greater than all gods, for the Lord does whatever pleases him in the heavens and on the earth, in the seas and all of their depths. He makes clouds rise from the ends of the earth, and he sends lightning with the rain, and he brings out the wind from the storehouses. Our God is great, isn't he? And he is worthy to be praised. Let us sing together this wonderful song, God Be Praised.
creation rising up to say we know. is for him, right? Amen to that. Our God does reign. Our God reigns. Well, again, good morning. It is so good to see all of you. I need to catch my breath. John, you don't have the luxury to do that. I need you to come up and uh, give us announcements, and the rest of you can have a seat for a moment and catch your breath, and we'll find out what is going on in the body of this church. Well, good morning. Welcome to Madawan Community Church. It's good to see everybody today. I do have some announcements I would like to bring to your attention that are not in your bulletin. So I'll go over a couple that are in your bulletin to give you a second to grab a pencil. All right. First off, we've got uh, Wednesday. Wow. This Wednesday at 6 o'clock, we got dinner and then go to our respective classes at 6.30. However, we got a special wow. There's a theme night for this wow, and it's pajama night. So that means... Then when you get up in the morning, if you go to school and you go to work, go in your pajamas and then come to WOW. Explain to everybody, I'm going to church later, that's why. <laughs> so there is a theme night for that. Wear your cap, wear whatever you do, wear whatever you wear for your pajamas. And then Thursday, January 6th, uh, 26th at 9 a.m., there is a ladies' breakfast that is at Hot Skillet. And then a couple of things that I have that are not in your bulletin. Camp scholarship money. There is scholarships for children to go to camp. If you or your children, not you, but if your children is interested in going to camp and you're interested in getting them out of the house for the summertime, there is camp scholarship money for that. Who should they see for that? Mr. Steve. See Mr. Steve if you are interested in that. And as we build up towards summer, I will continue probably to make that announcement. What is the cutoff date for that? quite full already okay. and they will fill up very quickly so the sooner the better today <laughs> <laughs> within the next uh, probably four weeks you're going to want to lock in your dates for summer camp four weeks okay thank you Stephen yep. and then another thing I want to mention there are some sign up sheets in the back I've gone over a couple of them the last couple of weeks but there's a new one back there something that's not in your bulletin it's for a chili cook off 
that will be on February 11th at 5 p.m. So there's a sign-up sheet for that back there. So take a look at all of those. Another thing I want to mention, tomorrow, Mr. Steve is going to be here at 10.30 a.m. to start taking down Christmas decorations. If there is anybody who is willing and able to come here and meet with him to help him take down those Christmas decorations, I know he would greatly appreciate that. That's a, pre that's a pretty legitimate excuse. <laughs> and then another thing I want to make mention of, um, there's on Friday, January 20th, there is a Stephen Curtis Chapman concert that will be at Calvary Bible Church, and it's to benefit alternatives. Obviously, they came yesterday. They're our, our mission for the month. And then uh, see the bulletin board in the back for more details for that. So back in the fellowship room. Also back in the fellowship room, the Paw Paw Community Choir Chorus, I'm sorry, is welcoming all singers. If interested, there is a letter on the bulletin board. And then another thing not to forget after we leave out of here and go back in the fellowship room, even if you are not staying for fellowship today, there is a Bible for Felicity from her baptism um, that... We'll be back there for signatures, so please attend to that. And then, another thing I want to mention, actually, before I go, before I go to the Bible in a year, who brought their Bible today? All right, love it, love to see it. I see a lot of the new ones, too, that is awesome. I'll continue to do that. I got called out by my son, because it was like two weeks ago I was supposed to do that. And he's like, Dad, you haven't done that. You said you were going to do that, so... Thank you, Zayden, for the gentle reminder. Kids, they're awesome. Um, and then, but I do want to mention uh, the Bible in a year. Obviously, Kenton had mentioned it last week too. But the U Version Bible app, getting involved in some type of devotional or reading the Bible in a year is absolutely awesome. So, love to see that everyone's got their new chronological Bibles. But there is also the U Version app that, if you don't have the time. I would encourage you to make the time to sit down to actually open and read your Bible. If you don't have the time and you're busy driving or anything like that, you can use the YouVersion Bible app to do the Bible in a year, and it will, you can press play. It will talk to you. It will do it for you. So that gets rid of any excuse. So I want to continue to encourage everybody to get into the Bible, especially reading your Bible in a year. But as we continue in our service, I would like to, again, welcome everybody, everybody that is, oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Kenton also has an announcement to make. So, I can go to two, but that was a great segue because how many of you have made it 15 straight days of reading? Wow, that's awesome. For those of you that haven't, or those of you that have and found it a struggle, would any of you think that it would be useful to have an accountability group for which you could call, for which you could text, for which you could discuss things that you have learned throughout the day? Anybody? Okay, if, if people think that there will be any use for that, we will, hi ladies, we will put together a sign-up sheet that will be back there during fellowship, and it'll probably, uh, I, I think I have one, am I on? I'm, I'm good. And so uh, we'll break it down into sections, so we'll have like a sunrise, a mid-morning, a lunch, so start thinking about like the times that you typically do it, so that you can group yourselves together with others in the congregation that will... Uh, probably be around the same time and uh, think about whether or not you'd be willing to be the leader of that group and so there will be a sign-up sheet for that speaking of accountability I uh, received an email from Levi last night I don't know how many of you remember Levi Levi came to our uh, church picnic and spoke about the jail ministry and uh, the email that he sent out was saying that they have a very difficult time in finding resources for specifically men who come out of the jail, who have been transformed, and don't have other problems. So they have tons of resources for people who struggle with drugs, alcohol, addiction, other things. But for those who come out relatively clean, they have nothing. Specifically, there are two men right now who are sleeping out on the streets that they bought tents for, and they can't really do much else. So. He wasn't asking us to necessarily open our homes or do anything like that. But if you could be in prayer and thought for creative solutions on how to get these 
gentlemen some resources so that they can find a job to support themselves, to find a place to live, things like that, uh, I would ask that you be in prayerful consideration for that because right now there's not much that they can do for these couple gentlemen. And it would be wonderful if we could come together as a church, come up with a really creative solution and be able to support Levi and the ministry in that way. So those are my two things. And I think that goes along with accountability really well too because they're looking to be accountable, and right now they have no, nobody. Can we be that church? Thank you, Kenton. Well, obviously, one thing I didn't mention before we move on is our prayer list. There was a couple of things that he added on there that are not on there, but please take that home, add that to your prayer list. And I encourage everyone to do that with your Bible reading every single morning. But as we continue, I would like to ask everybody who is willing and able to stand up and greet your neighbor. The sun shines out. It's beautiful. It Maybe cold out, but the sun's out. So the Lord can warm us. Welcome to NBCC. Another shameless plug for Wednesday nights. We had a really good discussion in our adult class this last week, and um, one of the questions we were um, talking about was, what does it mean, uh, blessed are the righteous, righteousness, seeking righteousness? What does that mean? What is righteousness? That's not a word we normally use in the English language unless you're church folk. And so what does it mean? And... Um, Hunger and thirst for righteousness. And it was brought up that to hunger and thirst means without food, without water, we're going to die. And so if we don't hunger and thirst for God, we're going to die. We're going to die eternally, right? And so we need to hunger. We need a thirst for him every day. And one of the uh, people who was at our um, class just said, this reminds me of the old hymn, I Need Thee Every Hour. And I could not get that tune out of my head all night long and all Thursday morning. And I get my little reminder on my computer that says, send the songs to church. And I said, okay, God, I need thee every hour. I get it. And so would you please join us in singing this wonderful song? If you'd like to sit for this and make this your uh, meditative song this morning, feel free to do so. There is a uh, bridge in there, kind of a little uh, contemporary thing, but uh, it's fairly easy to pick up. So let us sing this wonderful song. I need thee every hour 
most gracious Lord, no tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee, every hour I need thee, bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee, I need gracious and heavenly father we are here today to praise you to exalt you to worship you to lift you above every other thing to place you on the throne in our life especially if we've taken you off of it oh god we're here to praise you because as we read and as the psalmist put it you're the one who sends the lightning with the rain You're the one who calls the winds out of the storehouses. Oh, sure, we have instruments that say it's windy today, and this is how fast it was. But nobody knows where it exactly started or where it exactly ends, but you do. For you're the one who commands it all. You're the one at 
the simple sound of your voice, all stars, all planets, every galaxy came into being. When you said, let there be light, it happened. When you said, tree grow, it happened. And so we are here today to praise you because you are God Almighty. You are the sovereign one. You are El Shaddai. You're the one who when he says it, it has to happen. And so Lord, even though our world seems to be in chaos at times, and sometimes we begin to fill with fear and anxiety and wonder, oh God, are you there? All we need to do is go to your word. And we need to read what it is that you say. Where you say, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. And because you said it, it must happen. And so, Father, we praise you that you are a God who loves and cares for us and deeply wants an intimate relationship with us. Oh, Jesus, the Son of the living God and our Savior, we praise you today that you're the one who came in flesh and dwelt among man to tear down what mankind had set up thinking what religion was all about. And you came and said, no, it's about relationship. I'm not here to just rescue you from Rome. I'm here to rescue you from your sin. And so Jesus, we worship you today. And Holy Spirit, the third part of the Holy Trinity, we praise you today for being the one that God sent, the one who dwells among us, who sits in front, beside, and behind. And so, Father, today we ask that through your Holy Spirit that you would be in front of us, guiding us, leading us, that you would be beside us, encouraging us, whispering truths into our ear, that you would be behind us, protecting us, for we know, Father, that when we gather in your name, that when we begin to get in your word, when we stake a claim and say, Jesus, I'm running after you. I'm going to get in your word. No matter what comes every day, I'm going to spend time with you. We know when we do that, that the evil one hates it. He can't stand it. He knows if our soul is already, according to him, lost, because we've given ourselves to you, then he's going to do all he can to disrupt our walk with you. So in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, we bind Satan from each and every one of us. We bind him from this place and say, he's not welcome here because this is holy ground today. And so we ask that you protect us and guide us over the next days, weeks, and months. Father, as this song just said, I need thee every hour. God, we need you this year. We need you this month. We're going to need you this next week. We need you today. But God, we really do need you every hour. And so may this tune resonate in our minds this week. I need thee every hour. Oh, I need thee. Every hour, I need thee. Bless me now, my Savior, for I come to you. We are here today at the foot of the cross. And we ask that your spirit move in this place and speak to us today. We pray this in the awesome, powerful, glorious name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So refreshing to have sunshine, even if it's just for a little bit this morning after all these gray days. And I'm reminded of how God lightens our life through his son, through his Holy Spirit, that when our lives sometimes seem dark and depressing and we're down, it is Jesus that comes and fills us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Grace and peace to each and every one of you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, John talked about our Bibles, and I've been asked this, so I want to make clear. I'm going to be reading for the, this year probably the um, 
scripture that we use, our scripture lesson text, out of the NIV, out of these Bibles. So I encourage you to bring it as we perhaps page through. I'll be pointing out different verses to you, things you might want to underline. Again, consider this Bible a workbook Bible. Feel free to underline, to mark in the margins, whatever you'd like to do. And something else I encourage you to do is put your name in it. Because I have found a few Bibles floating around, and we all have the same looking Bible. So it's really hard to say, oh, is this yours or is this yours? So if it's floating around and there's no name in it, it'll end up on the table in the back for free for all. So inside, you'll see an area where it says presented to. I just put presented to Pastor Jonathan Lamb by Madawan Community Church, our church-wide read through the Bible program in 2023. Okay, so that's what I did. You can do your own thing, but... Definitely put your name in it, because as these get left behind on this table or that table, we want to make sure it gets back to the proper owner. It warmed my heart to come on WOW on Wednesday and have a few people approach me and say, Pastor, I didn't understand this, or Pastor, I didn't understand that, or my goodness, Pastor, that stuff we've read in Genesis it is playing out like a soap opera. And I'm like, yeah, it does. It does. It's gritty. It's earthy. It shows us right where mankind is, then and today. So uh, as Kenton uh, encouraged us to have accountability groups, I'm looking forward to in the weeks ahead, perhaps setting up some small groups that would like to meet in this uh, spring when our WOW sessions end. I'm looking forward to simply having Bible in the park where we can come, meet in the park over here, bring your NIV with you. Families, bring your children. They can play on all the monkey bar things over there. We can grab an ice cream from Moo Moo's, and we can sit in a circle in our chairs and discuss what we've been reading each week. I, I, I look forward to that. And maybe you'd want to invite some people to your house. I know we have some small groups already meeting. My goodness, the small group of the women's breakfast grew to 16 this week. Guys, the ladies are putting us to shame. We need to have some breakfast ourselves. So, uh, Maybe we can put that together too, but uh, it's just awesome for us to be able to dig into God's word and to read it together uh, in, in um, solidarity. Well, with that in mind, I'd like to invite the children to come forward for our children's message. Come right on up. Good morning. Good morning, Daddy. Can anyone tell me what this is? A dog toy. A dog toy. And what do you notice about it? It's been chewed on by our dog. It's, it's been used, yeah. It's got what on one end? Uh, a ball. It's got a ball on one end. Why, did, why do you think it has a ball on one end? For the dog to chew. For the dog to chew? What else? What else do we notice? A rope. There's a rope. Chewed. Anything else? What about the colors? It's many... red, green, and white. It's got three different colors, and if we look really closely at it, what do we notice about the texture? It's ro is it just one rope, though? It's a bunch of ropes. It's a bunch of them intertwined, isn't it? Why is that? It's stronger. Oh, it's stronger that way, because we have something that pulls on one side, probably the dog, and then a handle for somebody to pull on the other side. And if it was just one rope, how long do you think this would last? Depends on the size of the dog, but if they pull really hard and they pull for long enough, eventually this rope would it would break. Well, in Ecclesiastes, we have a message about that. And it says that two are better than one. Is that right? Is that true? Yeah. That's in the Bible. It must be true. But let's read on. It says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up the other. That's good. But woe to him who is alone and he falls, and there is no one else to lift him up. Again, if two huddle together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm by himself? Although a man might prevail against one foe when he is alone, two will withstand him. And three, a threefold cord is not easily broken. We have three different ropes that make up this rope, don't we? Do you know what this verse is used for most often? 
It's for a special, special, special occasion. Weddings. Weddings. Who are the three cords? The bride, the groom, and God. No, are any of you married? No. No, not yet. So does that mean that? Well, I knew are. So does that mean that this you verse doesn't apply to you? Hers. No, it doesn't. Because what are you a member of? God. The church. And what does the Bible say about the church? That the church is good. The church is married to who? God. Jesus. And Jesus. God well, too. for us, we have to know what to stay strong. We need to know God's word. word. So we have the church, we have Jesus, and we have God's word. And that is our cord of three strands that will not easily be broken. But in our read through the Bible, we started at the beginning, didn't we? We didn't start in Ecclesiastes. And in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he created all the animals and all of the living things, and then he created Adam and Eve. Were they supposed to be a cord of three strands? They were. Adam, Eve, and God, who walked with them in the cool of the day. They had access to walk with God and talk with God, just like you do. Isn't that neat? So, we've actually been fostering some dogs, which means that they stay at our house for a little while until they find another home. And so, Liesl and... Liesl and some of her friends have actually been making dog toys. And he took it apart. I took it apart to show you that this is one strand, isn't it? Would this make a good dog toy all by itself? No. Why not? What happens when we play with this? It gets ripped and it gets, a lot of times it gets twisted. And when it gets twisted, what happens to the edges? They start to fray, and they start to rip, and they start to tear. If we look at our Bible, when Eve was walking in the garden, the serpent was more crafty than any of the others, and he tempted her. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But is that what God really said? No. Instead... God's word got twisted. And her relationship with God began to fray and break and tear. and tear. That's one of the reasons that we need to be a cord of three. Who else was there when the, ser when the serpent was tempting Eve? Adam. Adam. It says that she gave some to Adam, who was with her, and he ate. So did he do his job of being a cord? No. Ecclesiastes says that if one falls, the other should pick, her up. pick him up. Did Adam do his job? No. no. And so then together, they both decided to be their own cord. And as Satan twisted God's word, what happened to each of them? They frayed, and they broke, and they tore. And when God came and said, where are you? What did they do? They had to hide. If you are a cord of three between the church, Jesus, and God's word, can you hide? No. Can we take this cord apart anymore? No. No, no we, can't, we can't separate the green from the white from the red. And no matter how hard we pull... No matter how hard we play, no matter what stress we put on this, this is strong. And it won't break. And it won't break. And so if you are a cord of three, if you rely on the church, if you rely on Jesus and you know God's word, there is nothing that can twist so that you will fray, tear, or Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for walking with me every day. Thank you that you have given me your word to follow, 
to learn and to know in my heart, in my mind, and in my soul. Help me to be a cord of three so that I will never fall away from you, be broken, frayed, or torn. Thank you that Jesus was broken, torn, and died so that I might live as a cord of three with you forever. And all God's children said, Amen. And when all God's children played together, the devil said, Bummer. Bummer. Thank you, Kenton. As you turn in your Bibles to uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And again, um, I'll be reading from our NIV <coughs> through the year Bible. And I wanted to uh, simply thank Jeff for filling in for me last minute, uh, last week. Whatever I had snuck up on me and whatever I had snuck away from me, but... 
it's one of those things where you have to make a call, you know, and um, in fairness to Jeff, I wanted to give him enough time to go through the files or put together a new sermon, whatever, and um, so I appreciated that and that time to be able to recoup, and uh, I'm doing great, so there we go. All right, let us stand together for the reading of God's Word. We begin at the very beginning, January 1. We're going to take a look at that beautiful first verse of the creation story and then continue on in a few other selected verses. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, hear the word of our Lord. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Chapter 2, verse 15. On the top of page 3. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And dropping down to verse 21 and continuing on few verses in chapter 3. So the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man, and the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she has been taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and his mother and is united with his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You, cert you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat it, uh, when, when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be made like God, knowing good from evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, for pleasure to the eye, and was desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of, <clears throat> of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden, excuse me, <clears throat> in the cool of the day, and they hid from God, from the Lord God, among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. This is the word of God. Be to God. Please be seated. Father God, we ask now that you'll help us to put aside in our minds the cares of this world that are pressing in upon us, the thoughts of the day, the thoughts of our schedules for the week ahead. Help us to compartmentalize those things, put them off in the corner of our brain for later consideration. And may we hear you speak to us today. We thank you for your word, most holy God. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts and minds be pleasing and acceptable to you, Lord God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So where to start? In the first two weeks of readings, we've covered a year's worth of sermons right here, my friends. There is so much packed in to this uh, first couple of weeks, but I decided we're going to start right at the beginning. I think four of the most beautiful words in all of Scripture are, in the beginning, God. 
in the beginning, God. That's the umbrella for everything, my friends, in life. In the beginning, God. And add six more words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What a beautiful and wonderful statement that is. Creation and the origin of life has been debated down through the centuries. There's been a lot of controversy, a lot of theories, some of them kind of wild, and unfortunately, they're being taught as truth, in fact, to our children in schools today. Now, there's two extremes to the entire creation story. One extreme says that science can answer everything, and it's all about science. And then on the other extreme, clear on the other end, you've got theologians that think that they can enter into the mind of God and be able to explain everything because they have raised themselves up to the level of God. Both are in danger of idolatry, my friends. If we aren't careful, science, which is simply a study of what God has created, can become a God, an idol. And human thought and human reasoning can also become an idol, a God. We need to remember what God told Job, and we're going to be getting into Job here shortly. <clears throat> Wonderful book in the Bible. While Job is suffering, he's trying to figure out what in the world has happened to me. Why are all of these things happening? What's going on here, God? What does Job do? He's complaining, and he's trying to figure it all out. And then God says to Job in chapter 38, verse 4, Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. I think those words are so important then and they are today. God is saying to Job, okay, Job, you've got all these questions, all these objections, and you're carrying on and on and on. Now, tell me, where were you when I created the heavens and the earth? Tell me, in your infinite wisdom, tell me all about it, Job. And God goes on for verse after verse after verse. It, it, it's a beautiful, wonderful a passage for us. You see, all of this can be broken down into basically two thoughts for us today, and that is creation and speculation. That's all it comes down to. Science cannot prove everything. Science cannot prove evolution. There are so many holes and gaps and everything else. It's either creation or it's speculation. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, I read from the uh, ESV here. We remember what Paul writes. He writes, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Faith. Faith. Not blind faith. Faith. I think the best apologetics defense these days that is out there for creation, for the biblical ac account of creation, is the Answers in Genesis ministry that is headed up by Ken Ham. And um, here in our church, we've used the Sunday school curriculum. Uh, we use the curriculum for Vacation Bible School. Answers in Genesis ministry puts out many films and podcasts and books and magazines. And I would encourage you to visit the Creation Museum. It's just south of Cincinnati. It's about a five, five and a half hour drive from here. Plan on, you know, a few days at the Creation Museum. Take your time as you go through. Every time I've gone through, I've got grandchildren. So, you know, it's kind of hard to just stop and read everything along the way. But uh, take your time there. You can walk through it in probably three hours. But if you really take your time and take it all in, Get a hotel room that night, and then go 45 minutes down the road south to an exact replica, replica of Noah's Ark that they have also built. It's fascinating to walk through. And a lot of these questions we have, well, how did the animals fit on the ark, and how could you have this, how could you do it's all explained, and it's all on display. You can walk through and see how the cages would have held infant animals, not big adults, not giraffes with their heads sticking out the windows like children cartoon books, you know. But you could see how small animals all came in and how Noah and his sons and their wives took care of it. I'd like to read for you from one of the um, publications that comes out. There's an Answers uh, magazine that comes out. And I'd like to share with you these words. He says, do you, do any of these statements sound familiar? Earth is millions of years old. Boy, we hear that all the time. 
I just heard that this week on a television program. That fossil's 350 million years old. Okay. Earth is millions of years old. Adam wasn't a real person. We hear that a lot in theology. There are many people that believe Genesis, being taught in some of our seminaries, is all metaphor and, and that type of thing. Humans evolved from ape-like ancestors. Genesis doesn't matter, just the New Testament. If you believe in creation, then you don't believe in science. Messages like these pervade the materials we read, the shows we watch, the news we listen to. Even many Christian leaders mix millions of years of evolution into the Genesis creation account. At every turn, we are bombarded with ideas, opinions, memes, mixed messages, and misinformation advocating for an evolutionary worldview. Trying to detangle these facts from fiction and these messages can feel frustrating, if not downright intimidating. As humans who will never be able to understand everything, how can we know what to believe? Who do we trust as our authority for truth? And where can we find a reliable starting point to understanding these difficult topics. Here's some good news. There is a starting point that we can trust from the beginning to the end, God's word. Daunting questions become far simpler to answer when we base our thinking on a true foundation and the firmest foundation for truth is scripture. When we accept God's word as it's written, we have a surefire starting point for reasoning about the world, including its difficult questions. I appreciate the uh, answers in Genesis ministry, and I'll be perfectly honest with you. As I was a young man growing up, I really didn't care. If a day was a million years, so what? Who cares? I've got my future ahead of me, you know? We really don't think about these things. It wasn't until later in life when I began to think, well, now wait a minute. Does this really make sense? Now, I have a lot of these magazines. I've been getting them for a number of years, and um, I'm kind of purging things out of my closet, you did not want to see the way my closet and my study look. So I'm going through, and I brought these to church. So I've got Answers in Genesis magazines. There's also an Answers for Kids, which is in the back. So on one of the tables, sorry, Sheridan, but I cleared some of her stuff off, and I put these things out. Help yourself, take them home, they're yours, keep them. When you're done with it, pass it on or, or go ahead and get rid of it. But uh, they do me no good sitting in my closet in a box, and I'd rather they be out there. There are so many good materials from Answers in Genesis um, I've got many books at home. This one here is the New Answers book, 25 Questions About Creation and Evolution and How We Reconcile the Two Differences. The truth is out there. It's simply not being presented fairly. So I invite you to help yourself to any of those materials in, in the back. Now, Answers in Genesis explains God's timeline and through uh, what they call the seven C's. Now, we're the th member of the four C's. Conservative Congregational Christian Conference. Here are the seven C's. First, there's creation. Then there's corruption, which is sin. Then there's catastrophe, which is the flood. Then there's confusion, which is the Tower of Babel. Then we go through a long period of the prophets and, and Israel's uh, history, and then we come to Christ, the cross, and finally, what we are waiting for today, my friends, is consummation, bringing it all together. Now, this morning, I want to address a few objections and just point out some worldwide truths that we as Christians, as we as believers, should seriously consider. First of all, the seven days of creation. When we find the seven days of creation, my friends, here we find the rhythm of all of life. Notice week, a week is seven days. It isn't ten days. You can't rearrange the 365 days of the year, and all of a sudden the world decides they're going to vote and say, we now determine that the week is a five-day week, or the week is going to be 13 days. It doesn't work. Why? Because God set into motion from the very beginning the sun, the movement of the planets, the stars. The earth rotates on its axis. It takes 24 hours in a day for that to happen. It goes around the sun. It takes a full year for it to do that. And during that time, we have the four seasons that we enjoy or maybe kind of mumble through at this time of year. God placed everything in motion. And no matter what anyone wants to think about that, you cannot take away the seven days that are listed in the Bible. They were created. It's God's invention. After each day of creation, as you read in, in the first part of Genesis, we read God saw that it was good. God saw that it was good over and over and over. God was saying, this is perfect. 
this is perfect. I like this. Now, the idea of millions of years, and I had to come to terms with this because, as, again, as a child growing up, I didn't worry a whole lot about it, and I got bombarded with all this stuff in the school system, too, about, well, we just don't know, and we think, you know, this, that, and the other thing. But if you think about it, if God took millions of years to build the earth and put the earth together, and we hear that these fossils that we find, even in high mountain places like the Himalayas, and that took millions of years, you have to ask yourself, then how is it that death and destruction came before Adam and Eve were placed on the earth? You see, death and destruction didn't come until after Adam and Eve sinned. That means all the fossils we are finding came after the fall, which means it came after the creation of human life. There's no way that these animals could have died two million years before Adam was created because death wasn't known. So we can kind of put all that aside and say that doesn't make sense, so let's come back to the idea of a 24-hour day, even though it's hard for us as people, as humans, to wrap our minds around that. Well, the next thing I wanted to uh, reference here, number two, is the reference to the Trinity. Uh, these are things we like to talk about in seminary and quiz ourselves on, but the very first reference of a Trinity is found in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. The Spirit of God was hovering over the water. The Spirit of God was hovering over the water. Then later in verse 26, we read that God says, Let us, let us make mankind in our image. He didn't say, let me make mankind in my image. He said, let us. Here's the sense of, of Trinity, that, that whole um, doctrine that begins to be peeled away for us as we work our way through the Bible, because there are many references throughout Scripture. And then in chapter 3, verse 22, we also read these words, the man now has become like one of us. One of us. Here we find, my friends, the framework for God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. One God, three persons. Number three, I want us to remember and consider that man is a unique creature. And when I say man, I'm talking not just male. I'm talking about male and female. Mankind is God's unique creature because he created us in his image. All the animal life out there is not created in God's image. We are. We are created in God's image. Okay, now, I love dogs. I love cats. I love pets. You know, I, I believe in being compassionate to animals and all those kinds of things. But we need to be careful about raising the animal life up to the same level as human life because it isn't. We are created in God's image with personality, a self-conscience. We can make decisions. We can be creative. We have a soul. We have a spirit that will live forever and ever. Someone once said the human trinity is the, our physical side, our psychological side, and our spiritual side. That's something the animal kingdom does not have. We are not equal to, but we are rather superior to the animal kingdom. The animal kingdom is not there for our abuse and misuse it is simply the way God created us. It's interesting to note that in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul says that he would pray for the church's body, mind, and spirit. Body, mind, and spirit. A sense of that uh, human, physical, mankind, trinity. The next thing I'd like to point out is that in verse uh, 15 on page 3, we read that man was made for work. God placed Adam in the garden and he put up a hammock and told him to chill out for eternity. No, he put him in the garden to work. To work. To take care of it. This is your environment. Take care of it, Adam. Take care of it for me. The next thing I want to point out, very important for today's world. God created two sexes. Male and female. Period. God did not create many sexes. God did not create us so that we're born a man and now I can rethink myself into becoming a woman or vice versa, a woman rethinking herself into becoming a man. We are biologically either male or female. It's just as plain and obvious as we can see. It's not based upon how we feel or what our emotions are. God created us male and female. The Hebrew word for man is ish. And the Hebrew word for woman is isha. 
isha. Woman is the other part of man. God created man, saw he needed a partner, so he took from man and created woman. God, uh, Adam was created from the dust of the earth. Eve was taking, taken from Adam. God didn't create a bunch of dust again and start all over. He took the woman out of the man. That's why you're the term woman, because women, the woman came out of man. I like what Dr. Matthew Henry says concerning Adam and Eve. He writes, God did not take her from the head to be superior to him, nor from the foot to be inferior to him. He took her from his side to be equal to him. To be equal to him. You see, the woman was created to belong to him. This whole business about wives submitting to your husbands, I think, has been misunderstood and even taken to extremes where it has given some men license to be abusive to their wives and, and to women. And this has been a sin in and of itself because the words have been twisted. When we read wives submit, what, what, what God is saying here is, is Eve, I've created you out of man, so respond to him. Respond to him, listen to him, answer to him, be alongside him, work with him. Now, I could say a lot more on the roles of men and women, but I'm not going to do that because I can easily be misunderstood, and we're on a roll, and I'm going to continue on to number six. <laughs> All right, number six. Marriage is a holy institution from God. Marriage is a holy institution from God. Let's see, on page uh, three it was, verses 22. Then the Lord God made the woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, wow. <laughs> no, the man said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. Remember, man was given the job to name all the creatures. And he sees Eve, and he realizes she has come from me. So I will name her, I will call her woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united with his wife, and they become one flesh. I know it's a touchy subject these days, but that's because we've made a total mockery of marriage today. God did not create Adam and Steve. He created Adam and Eve. It's right here. It's as plain as can be. And to take it and argue it and twist it and mess around with it, my friends, oh, we are treading where we ought not tread. I like this first wedding ceremony. Marriage is God's idea. One man, one woman. And I think this must have been beautiful. I think as I grew up, I picture, okay, so God caused Adam to fall asleep. Okay, so he's sitting there in the garden. All of a sudden, he's sleeping, leaning against a rock. God reaches into his rib, yeah, uh, side, whips out a rib, sews it all back up, puts it all back together so it's nice and smooth, sculpts the woman out of it and goes, Adam, wake up, check it out. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I think what happened, God caused Adam to fall asleep. And when he took that rib, I think God kind of walked over here. And he sculpted the woman out of Adam's flesh. Adam wakes up and kind of wondering maybe a little bit what happened. Thought, wow, that's quite a sleep. And he gets up and he's just kind of standing there and all of a sudden he hears something. It's a heavenly wedding march, if you will. God comes around the corner like a father comes with his daughter. And he takes the bride up to Adam. He says, Adam, here's your wife. Here's your wife. Can you imagine what Adam must have thought? That is one of the most beautiful pictures, my friends, and we mimic it in every wedding ceremony. As I do weddings, whether it's in this church or other churches, one of the things I do is I stand back and, and the groom is standing here and the bride, you know, the doors open up and the bride's going to come down the aisle with dad. There's significance with it being dad. Who was Eve's dad? God. 
And, and here comes the bride, and as I'm standing there waiting, and you know, the music and everybody's standing there, everything's all beautiful and pretty and all that stuff, I always like to take a gl just a quick glance over the groom. And every single wedding I've done, the fellow's standing there and he's misty eyed. He's on the verge of tears because here comes his wife, and she's beautiful. And he's excited. This is going to be my wife. We're going to be married. This is the first wedding ceremony. God comes down through the pathway of the garden as a father, and he presents the bride. He presents Eve to Adam. I believe Adam, ladies, was the most handsome man you could ever possibly dream of seeing. And no one comes close to looking like Adam. I try, but it doesn't work, okay? <laughs> I believe Eve was the most beautiful woman ever to step foot on this earth. Think about it. These people had no blemishes, no gray hairs, no pimples, no pock marks, no nothing. They were absolutely gorgeous and perfect because sin had not entered into the world yet. Beautiful, beautiful people. One man, one woman. Not two men, two women, two men, one woman, blah, 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 blah. Okay? That is outside of God's realm. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 4, Jesus then affirms this. He said, this is why it is said that a man shall leave his home, be married to his wife, and the two become one. This is how God instituted it from the very beginning. So Adam is supposed to uh, take care of his wife. He's responsible for her. She's been presented to him. And again, we need to be careful as our culture and as our world is making such a mockery of what God has made so beautiful, so wonderful, so holy. Now, why is it that God fights against the ideas of creation and kind of, you know, really pushing the evolution thing on our children in school? And why is it that all this uh, sexuality thing is such a big deal this day? It, it's simple, my friends. It's because man is doing everything he can to make God irrelevant. That's all it comes down to. It is the human pride, it is the sinful nature of mankind to say, God, you're irrelevant. You don't know what you're talking about. The Bible is all old. We're not going to listen to your word. We're going to do things our way. And so by doing these things, we think we're hiding from God. What did Adam and Eve do when they hid from God? They sewed fig leaves together. Now, fig leaves are not going to cover you very well or for very long. And it's no different than today. We're trying to cover ourselves with the fig leaves of our own inventions, of all the things we can possibly think of to do, to do things and to teach things that are contrary to God's word. That's what we're doing today. We're covering ourselves with fig leaves. Number seven, we have the introduction of sin. And uh, boy, there's a lot of questions on this. A lot of sermons we could preach on that, but let's get right to it. There's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And my friends, I want to come in defense for the apple. I love apples. I don't believe that Eve ate from an apple tree. Okay, the Bible never says apple. I've heard some people say it's pomegranate. Some believe it's this, it's that, the other thing. I don't know what it was. The Bible doesn't tell us. I'm glad it doesn't. Maybe it's a fruit that doesn't even exist anymore. It's now extinct. But let's raise up the apple. The apple's a good, healthy thing. And also, the second thing is, Satan was not a slithering snake. This is probably one little bit of a disagreement I have with the Creation Museum, because as you walk through and you see all the different kind of things, they do have a snake up in the tree. And we read it was not a snake, but it was a serpent. A serpent. It was a dragon. See, these are the things that I really enjoy about getting into some of these books, because it causes us to think outside the box that we've become so accustomed to over our years of thinking about these things. It was a dragon. And then God took the legs away from the dragon and said, you will now slither. You know, fire-breathing dragons in the Creation Museum, they believe fire-breathing dragons actually existed. We even see hints of it in Job. And maybe some of these tales about the knights going off and saving the princess and he slays the dragon, maybe some of that stuff isn't so far-fetched. Have you ever wondered why the Chinese culture is so into dragons? If they never existed, then where did the dragon come from? Is it all simply mythology? Is it just made up? And if so, why is it noticed in all the cultures around the world? Stuff for us to think about. Stuff for us to think about. Anyway, why temptation? In Genesis chapter 1 and 2, we read that man was created 
innocent, not righteous. Now listen carefully to what I say because this is going to be new to a lot of us. Man was created not a righteous being. He was created an innocent being. Righteousness is innocence that has been maintained in the presence of temptation. Righteousness is innocence that has been maintained in the presence of temptation. You can't be a, right, a righteous person until you've been tempted first. You see, God allowed the temptation to come into the garden so that mankind could be righteous. You and I cannot be righteous until we say no to sin. That's where our righteousness comes from. You see, righteousness has to do with virtue, doing what's, doing what's right when you have the opportunity to do what's wrong. That's how you become righteous. I have the option to do the wrong thing, and I'm really pulled into doing that, and I'm really tempted, and I want to go down there, but I say no, and I take the virtuous path instead. That's a step of righteousness. Adam was not created righteous. He was created innocent. He needed to become righteous. So what happened? He fell. And in Romans chapter 3, we read that none are righteous. No one is righteous. Not one person on the face of the earth who has ever walked or who lives or ever will is a righteous person. Only one, and that's Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus is referred to as the new Adam, the second Adam, because Jesus was able to do what Adam couldn't. Adam gave in to the temptation. He lost it. He, he's now not righteous, and none of us are. But Jesus came in, and he was tempted just like Adam, and Jesus withstood the temptation. He is the new Adam because he is righteous. And we find our righteousness, my friends, in Jesus Christ alone. By putting our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's where our righteousness is. So am I a righteous person today? Yes, because I behave myself? No, because my faith is in Jesus Christ. That's where it comes from. That's why God put the temptation there. Adam, I want you to be a righteous man. And he failed. Righteousness doesn't come through the law. It doesn't come through ritual. It doesn't come through all these legalisms or all this other stuff or sacrifices. It comes through our faith in Jesus Christ. Now the serpent approaches Eve. Why did he come to Eve instead of Adam? Oh, because women are the weaker sex. Whoa, wait a minute. Don't you dare say that. Women are strong and beautiful in their own way in the way that men are strong and beautiful in their own way. That's why we compliment one another. Satan came to Eve because Satan is smart. Okay? He realizes Eve has gotten the information secondhand. Notice God didn't say to Adam and Eve, you shall not eat from the tree. He told Adam. Adam told Eve, his wife. So she gets it secondhand. That makes her vulnerable. You see? So Satan comes to Eve and goes, uh, if I went to Adam, he's probably going to hold the line. But Eve got it secondhand, so I have a much better chance to deceive her because she didn't get the information straight from God. In fact, Eve proves that. She said, well, oh, yeah, we can't even touch it. God didn't say that. Now, maybe Adam said to her, hey, don't eat of it. In fact, don't even look at it. Eve, don't even touch it. We don't have it in the Scripture, but we do have that Eve said, hey, you know, we're not even supposed to touch. No, 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 no. God never said that. So Satan is beginning to get his way into Eve. He's beginning to question her and cause her to doubt. You see, Satan knows how to approach people with the word of God. And he says the most important words that we're hearing today all around the world, even within the church, did God really say? People are questioning this Today, my friends, I believe God is sifting the church. I believe there are a lot of people that have sat in the pews that don't really understand or fully believe the word of God. A lot of people that left the church during COVID have not come back, and they're not coming back. I believe God is sifting his church. He wants the true believers to stay on top, and all these false carnal Christian people are falling through. Because in God's word, my friends, we find the answers. God says, or people are saying today, did God really say that? Did God really say that about life? Did God really say that about our sexuality? Oh, yeah, it kind of says that here, don't I? Well, let me rearrange the words and come up with a new theological philosophy. 
We're seeing that everywhere today, my friends, and it's frightening. It's frightening. In chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, we notice the word certainly. God said, you will certainly die. That's why we all die. What did Satan say? Satan said, you will not certainly die. Eve, open your mind. Open your eyes, girl. You can be just like God. You and Adam, come on. Satan contradicts God's word. Satan knows the word better than you and I do. And he takes this word and he twists it and he turns it and he causes us to fall because he says to us every day, did God really say that? No, 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 no. Let me give you real truth. I'll give you the truth that will really make you free. And so Satan contradicts God's word. He substitutes his word. We need to remember the book of Romans teaches us that faith leads to obedience. Unbelief leads to disobedience and doubt leads to disobedience always, every time. Now we notice here a threefold temptation that is presented to Eve in verse 6. It's good for food. Right there is the appeal to the flesh. It's good. It is pleasant to the eyes. They often say the eyes are kind of that window into the soul. It comes to your mind. Here's the mind. And the third thing is it is desirable for wisdom. Here comes our pride and that religiosity. Oh, I'm such a religious person. I'm so wise. 1 John Chapter 2, verse 16 tells us that these things are not from God, but they are from the world. They are from the world. This pattern is the same pattern Satan used to tempt Jesus in the wilderness. And we'll probably cover that a little bit more at another time. Number eight, we see the attempt to cover up the sin. They try to cover their sin with fig leaves. What should they have done? They should have confessed straight up. They should have just gone to God. Instead of hiding from him, they should have said, God, oh, God, we have sinned. We have sinned. Have pity on us, Lord. We did the very thing you told us not to do. But they didn't. They hid. And so it is for many of us. We hide our sin through going to church every Sunday and not really dealing with it by following rules and rituals, by being legalistic in the way we live our life. We try to cover ourselves up, and what we need to do, my friends, is forget all that and come to God and humble ourselves before him directly, you and Jesus. You don't need a priest or minister to do that for you. You can do it yourself. God covered their sin by doing what? Here we see the very first foreshadowing of what Jesus does for you and me. He killed an animal, a blood sacrifice, and he wrapped him in skin, the skin of an animal. Think of a deer. Okay, he shot the deer, or, you know, and then he gutted it, and he took the skin, and he gave them clothing. That's what Jesus Christ does for you and me through his death. He covers us in his death, so we no longer have our sin exposed to God. Number nine, the deception of sin, it all began in the garden. There's no confession from Adam and Eve. In fact, they play the, ba- the, the blame game. Chapter three. Verse 12, I get such a kick out of this. Boy, oh boy, is this ever like we are today, huh? Uh, That's on page 4, up at the top, verse 12. So God comes and he says, "Uh, who told you you were naked? Did you eat from that tree? And in verse 12, he reads, "Uh, uh, that, that woman you gave me, the woman you gave me, she gave me some of the fruit to you. It's not my fault, it's her fault. What does the woman do? The serpent told me I could eat it. It's his fault. And then you really want to take it further. Well, it's your fault, God, because you put the tree in the garden. If you hadn't done that in the first place, this wouldn't have happened. Where do we read where Adam and Eve fell on their faces before God and said, oh, God, we're so sorry. Nowhere. They're playing the blame game. And we play that blame game for the past 4,000 years. And you hear it today. Everyone is a victim of whatever. It's not my fault. You see, when we deceive ourselves, as Adam and Eve did, we find a way to justify our sin. In the um, first two weeks of our readings, my friends, it's amazing to see the deception that went on, isn't it? I mean, as, as, as we read these words, wasn't it just amazing? Story after story after story after story. And we're going, 
This is all about deception. That's why I decided to title the sermon I did, Redemption Out of, the Re uh, out of All This Deception. First of all, Cain kills Abel, and then what, what's his answer? Well, oh, am I my brother's keeper? I don't know where he is, God. You go find him. Am I my brother's keeper? We go through the flood. We go through the Tower of Babel. What was the problem with the Tower of Babel? The people were trying to become God-like themselves. And so God created many cultures out of the Tower of Babel. He confused the languages, and the people couldn't understand, so they spread out across the earth. That, must, that migration must have been incredible. I mean, if you think about it, all these different people groups spread out all across the land. They go across India. They work up into China. They cross over North America, Central America, South America, Africa. And, and you know, we're just reproducing like rabbits, as people would say. You know, people are having children, and the families grow, and the tribes grow, and then they get mad at each other, so they break up, you know, and you have a tribe here and a tribe here. Just amazing how the world then was taken over by humankind. I find it kind of interesting how today we're so concerned about trying to get everybody back together again. I mean, really, I think about that sometimes. God divided us up into different cultures for a reason, and I'm not saying we shouldn't respect or even appreciate and celebrate other cultures. Absolutely. I'll go to Taco Bell. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Qdoba. All right, okay. You know, we can celebrate all the different cultures, but why is mankind just so bent on trying to get us all to be as one again? We are in the process of rebuilding the Tower of Babel. That's what we're trying to do. We are trying to come up with all the solutions and build this all up ourselves by mankind's effort. And so we're trying to rebuild this Tower of Babel today, worldwide. Abraham deceives Egypt. He goes to Egypt, and what does he do? He's afraid. Sarai, tell, her, tell them that you are my sister, not my wife. Because if you do, they're going to kill me because you're a beautiful woman, and then they will have her. So you just tell them you're the sister. <clears throat> when Lot chooses the land, what did he do? He chose the best for himself. He kind of deceives Abraham, although I think Abraham was probably a little bit smarter, but he just took the best land for himself. In January 4, we read how Sarai deceived Abram. She took her servant, Hagar, and said, hey, I can't have a baby, so here's my servant. Have a baby through her. Instead of keeping his faith in the Lord. January 6th, Sarah lied that she did not laugh when she heard that she was going to have a child. She was trying to deceive the angels who were there. Lot's daughters deceived their father by getting him drunk. Abraham deceived Abimelech. Once again, here we go. This Sarah is not my wife, she's my sister. January 9, Jacob and Esau. They, uh, Jacob took advantage of Esau two times, and he deceived him. Isaac deceives Abimelech, like father, like son. What does he say? Uh, Rebecca here, uh, yeah, she's my sister, she's not my wife. Wow, like father, like son. Isaac learned well from dad. He's doing the exact same thing. Then Rebecca... She deceives her own husband, Isaac, because she favors Jacob over Esau. Deception. Deception upon deception. January 10, we read how Laban deceived Jacob multiple times, over and over and over and over again. It took a long time for Jacob to break away from Laban. And it wasn't just because of the two wives, but it was because of the, the flocks and everything else that he was taking care of. January 12, Simeon and Levi deceived those who... Uh, abused and misused Dinah, their sister. And so it is that to seek revenge, they deceived them and ended up wiping them all out. Tamar deceives Judah. Joseph's brothers deceive their dad, Jacob, and fake Joseph's death. Potiphar's wife, which is where we are today in our readings, deceives the guards and the judges, and Joseph finds himself in jail. Sin at its root, my friend, is deception. It is deception that takes us away from the order that God has created from the very beginning. And thank God it is Jesus Christ who redeems us from the deception. A little footnote here as we're wrapping up. It's interesting to note that between 
Adam and Abraham, there's 2,000 years. And by the way, we've got a wonderful chart downstairs on the fellowship wall. It looks confusing at first. It just takes time to kind of study it for a while, but it's really amazing uh, how they lay out what's going on in all of world history. But it's 2,000 years from Adam to Abraham, 2,000 years from Abraham to Jesus, and from Jesus today is 2,000 years. One 1,000 year, two, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, six days. God created the first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth, sixth. Are we on the verge of the Lord's return? If these can be broken down in a six 1,000 periods to where we are today, are we perhaps entering either the very end of that sixth 1,000 year period, or are we entering into the 1,000 year? Maybe that 1,000 year rest refers to the 1,000 year of Jesus here on the earth when all will be made right and rest. That's exciting to think, my friends. Christ could return at any moment. Something to think about. When God created, he said, it is good, it is good. God created, my friends, for his delight, for his pleasure, for his glory. God created mankind for fellowship. He created us to be a free moral agent. You choose, you decide. He did not create us to be push-button robots that simply, yes, master, yes, master. That's not love. Guys, when you date a gal and you fall in love with her, you don't want her to go, yeah, okay, yeah, I love you. All right, yeah, I'll get married. No, you want her to love you back. You want her to be excited. God wants us to be excited to have that fellowship with him. That's what God wants. We aren't robots. We have a choice whether to worship God or to ignore him and do our own thing and run our own way. I like what one, one author said, the world is God's theater. The world is God's theater. We are on the stage and he has placed us upon his stage. We get to be playing out God's play as we journey through life. Here we behold the wonder of God as we look at God's creation. It is here in God's creation that we can adore God with complete reverence. As we see the beauty all around us, all of creation screams out and cries out to the glory of God, as the psalmist writes. We witness God's wisdom on complete display throughout the heavens and the earth. All the universe testifies to the glory of God. God's wisdom, goodness, knowledge, and power is on display for each one of us. We just have to look at it and let it soak in. As the earth's bounty feeds us, so it is Christ offers himself to us. As the heavens, the sun, the moon, the stars light our way, so it is Jesus Christ lights our way. And as the air that we breathe, which is essential for life, as it sustains our life, so it is the Spirit of God sustains our lives. My friends, this is our Father's world. And you and I are here because he loves us and he wants us to respond to him just like a bride responds to her groom. Amen. God, how great you are. How awesome you are. We don't have the words to begin to be able to proclaim your glory, your wonder, your awe. Father, forgive us for the pride that we have in our hearts, the things that we know everything, or that we even know better than you how things should be. So we make a mess of it. Just like it happened in the garden. Father, as Jesus taught us to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So it is, Father. We yearn to live a life a life where we can say no to those temptations around us so that we are not deceived by the words of our accuser and our deceiver, the evil one. But rather through the power of your Holy Spirit, oh God, enable us through your power to overcome these things that come our way so that we can live a life that is holy as, as you tell us, be holy for I am holy so that we can be a righteous people in a world that is so bent on doing the wrong thing. 
so that we can have that witness to those around us who think they have found the answers outside of you. Oh God, we ask you to guide us through the power of your Holy Spirit through this crazy, mixed up world of ours. May we always keep our perspectives correct. And then when we do fall, forgive us, Lord. We are ever so thankful, Lord Jesus, that you have made us righteous in our Father's sight because of what you did at Calvary. Our righteousness is in you, Lord Jesus, in you alone. And so to you be all honor and glory and praise now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. At this time, our gifts, tithes, and offerings will be received. Please fill out the attendance pad in the pew uh, next to you and pass it to your neighbor. Father, we give you thanks for all good things. We ask now that these offerings that have been received will be used for the furthering of your kingdom. May truth go forward in a world full of deception so that many more come to know Christ as their righteous Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I think that minute hand spun around faster than it ever has in my entire life today. So for those of you who have somewhere to be, um, feel free to leave. But we're... I'm, I'm going to have us sing the first verse. This is just too beautiful a hymn. We're going to sing the first two verses of 58. This is my father's world. Receive the benediction, and then we'll close with the third verse today.
sure what the third verse will be, but whatever words come up, we'll sing them. <laughs> may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and lift up his countenance upon you. May the Lord give you grace and peace for all your days. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>